Well, brethren, as we enter upon another day of ministry and attention to the scriptures, we do well to bring the very scriptures to mind as we make our way to the throne of grace. Two such scriptures that have come to my mind this morning. Ask, and it shall be given you. You have not, because you ask not. Not because it was the sovereign decree of God for you to have not, but because you asked not. And while I think it's inaccurate to say God does nothing, but he does it in answer to prayer, I believe that goes far beyond the scriptures. Who knows all the things God does where nobody prayed? I believe it's accurate to say we have no biblical grounds to expect God to work on our behalf if we do not pray. And we want God's working, so let's seek his face together. Holy Father, we cannot come to you in the light of these texts of Scripture without acknowledging the sin of our wretched creaturely confidence that so often has resulted in our spiritual blight and barrenness. And we pray that for Jesus Christ's sake, you would forgive our prayerlessness. Forgive us the creature confidence that in reality is a form of idolatry. And help us even now to have a deep felt sense of our utter dependence upon you we would go out of ourselves with every fiber of our inner life, crying out to you that you would graciously come and assist us in this hour. Together we thank you for the way you have answered prayer and blessed human means uh, to rid me of much of the vertigo. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy and now we pray that more goodness and more mercy shall follow us as we track together through the scriptures concerning our great responsibilities as your servants in guiding your people to think and act biblically in the great privilege and responsibility of bringing the gospel of the grace of God to needy sinners Send your spirit upon your servant and upon these dear men gathered together and those who will be listening and watching these lectures in subsequent days. Meet with them as well, we pray, in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. 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 Well, brethren, as we consider our tasks of pastoral oversight in shepherding the flock of God, we come in this hour to examine another aspect of that task as it pertains to the corporate life of the people of God. In our previous studies, we've examined some of our major responsibilities relative to the corporate life of God's people, the church worshiping, the church gathering to pray, the church nurturing itself in spirit-empowered body life, the church engaging in radical or corrective discipline, the church properly ordered with God-given officers of elders and deacons, and then in our last two lectures, the church nurturing and cultivating inter-church relationships. We come in this hour to consider the church evangelizing or communicating the gospel to a lost world. And in particular, we're going to focus our attention upon your responsibilities as an under-shepherd with respect to this wonderful privilege and solemn responsibility to bring the gospel to others. And so we're going to consider then the biblical perspectives and directives that you as a pastor should have and by the grace of God be able to impart to your people. In taking up this vast and weighty concern, I should underscore the fact that the primary focus of these two lectures, 
will be that of the local church and its local witness and evangelistic endeavors, not the responsibility and activity of global witness. While some of the exegetical material is as broad as the world in its scope, the practical suggestions and application of that exegetical material will be narrowed down primarily to the local situation in which you and I are called to labor. The issue of church planting and overseas missionary transcultural endeavors will not be addressed in these lectures. Perhaps in another forum and another time that can be addressed because in that endeavor, as well as all others, the scriptures are a sufficient and authoritative guide for our missionary program in these transcultural issues, even as they are a guide in our local evangelistic endeavors. I will attempt to open up our subject in the two lectures under four major headings, namely, the biblical mandate for the task of evangelism, secondly, the biblical motives for fulfilling the task of evangelism, thirdly, some practical means for accomplishing the task of evangelism, Fourthly and finally, some practical considerations relative to the task of evangelism. First of all, then, we address the biblical mandate for the task of evangelism. In selecting the texts which embody this biblical mandate, I have chosen those which ought to loom large in your thinking as a pastor text which ought to be graciously implanted in the consciousness of your people by clear and compelling exposition, loving, earnest exhortation, and discreet, frequent repetition. And I've chosen those couplets of words, and you'll notice in none of them was the word oppressive browbeating. When it comes to evangelism, it seems that there is a virus in the hearts of many pastors. They engage in an oppressive browbeating of their people. And I want to set before you these texts which give us the duty, texts which I believe must master us and which we in turn must attempt by means of careful exposition earnest and loving exhortation, frequent repetition to see inscribed in the hearts and consciences of our people. I have chosen a key text from each of the major sections of the New Testament. First of all, the Gospels, then from the book of Acts, and then from one of the epistles. And of course, your mind is already going to the text I've chosen from the Gospels, the Great Commission is found at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to park on this text and do a little exegetical work because I am persuaded that this text, above all others, is a text that ought to be well known and loved by you, by your people, and ought to govern their evangelistic perspectives and endeavors. I read verses 16 to 20 of Matthew 28. But the eleven disciples went into Galilee unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said to them, and spoke unto them, came to them, and spoke unto them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Going, therefore, it's a participle, not a direct imperative, though it draws some of the weight of the central verb, which is an imperative, but can be legitimately rendered. Going, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, behold, he wants us to take seriously what he's about to say. Pay attention carefully. As I've given you this task, you must know and believe I am with you always, each and every one of the days, even unto the end of the world. Now, first of all, let's establish from the passage to whom were these words spoken. According to verse 16, it was at least the 11 disciples. The text could not be more clear or explicit, but the 11 disciples went into Galilee unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Some suggest that the 500 brethren spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, 6 may also have been present. It cannot be clearly proven, but when we look at the various texts and where Jesus was, it could well be that these words were spoken not just to the 11, though particularly to them, but in the company of those 500 witnesses of our resurrected Lord. However, it is clear that these words define the abiding task of the church unto the consummation of all things. Notice the breadth of the scope. They are to make disciples of the nations. And in a very real sense, these words of our Lord are an explicit formal negation of their previous commission as recorded in Matthew 10 verses 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and charged them saying, Go not into any way of the Gentiles and enter not into any city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here is a negation of the previous commission. Now no longer go not, but going, disciple, literally, the nations. So the scope is all of the ethne, all of those cultures and places where those Gentile dogs have lived in centuries of darkness, abysmal spiritual darkness. And as I commission you, my commission envisions in its scope all of the nations. And then the time frame when this directive is binding and he says, I am with you unto the end of the age. So our Lord envisions this commission resting down essentially primarily in the beginning upon the 11 disciples, but he envisions it being carried out by his people until the last one of his elect is gathered in. The last one envisioned in John 10, 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, the fold of Israel, them also I must bring. There shall be one fold, one shepherd. And when the last one is brought in, and whatever maturity the Lord intends that last one should have until he calls the whole church out of the graves and unto himself the living saints, this commission rests like a vast canopy over the church of Christ until the return at the consummation of the age. So the words were spoken clearly to the 11, possibly to the 500, with this vast scope and with this time frame. But now notice, secondly, the essence or the heart of the passage and its teaching. The context of the directive is significantly and pervasively Christ-centered. Our Lord is careful to bookend the task by pointing, first of all, in verse 18, to his own position of exaltation and power. And in verse 20, he gives the promise of his abiding presence with his people 
in the performance of the duty enjoined. And if our Lord saw that it was essential to bookend the task of evangelism by drawing all eyes to himself and then promising that he himself will be with his people in the task, then in all of our teaching and preaching of the duties and privileges of evangelism, it must throb with this Christ-centered perspective. It will be the most effectual means to keep you from browbeating and to keep your people from coming under false guilt. Our eyes must continually be fixed upon him who has all authority in heaven and on earth and who has said, I am with you all of the days. Any given day I awake with a heart set upon seizing any evangelistic opportunities God may give or as I plan to engage in an activity of communicating the gospel to others, I go forth under the authority of him who has all authority in heaven and upon earth and with the promise that that Christ is with me. Now the assumed activity that is highlighted in the passage is the going. It's not an imperative verb, it is a participle, but it, it draws to itself some of the imperatival force of the central task explicitly commanded in the word, make disciples. Perhaps it could be better rendered, disciple ta ethne, disciple the nations. That's the central task in the evangelistic endeavor. It is not decision the nations, bring the nations into some kind of external contact with and involvement with the church, but disciple the nations. And when the disciples heard the word disciple the nations, they would pour into it all that they themselves had both seen as our Lord, according to John 4, was making and baptizing more disciples than John. They themselves were the experience had the experience of being made disciples by the call of Christ. They had heard him in his disciple-making when he turned to multitudes who were flocking around him and said, wait, hold off, count the cost. Any man comes to me, hates not father, mother, brother, sister, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not take up his cross cannot be my disciple. Whoever forsakes not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. They were with him when the would-be disciples drew near. And our Lord dealt with them with straightforward words, laying before them the cost of becoming attached to his person, attached to his teaching, attached to his will and his ways. So when he gave this imperative, disciple the nations, it had distinct form and content in the mind and hearts of those to whom the commission was given. So they are to disciple the nations and the two attendant activities, two more participles are, baptizing them into the name of the triune God, clearly indicated that in the discipling process there was a fundamental understanding of God existing as Trinity and moving out towards sinners in the full energy of his Trinitarian being. God the Father planning and sending God the Son sent and willfully, deliberately giving himself a ransom for sinners. And God the Holy Spirit applying with power, transforming grace in the hearts of men to be baptized into the name of the triune God unless it becomes an empty formula means that the person who's been made a disciple has been schooled in fundamental Trinitarian theology. That's inherent in the biblical doctrine of salvation. 
And to what degree, that could be debated, but certainly that it must be part of meaningful discipleship cannot be in the light of this passage. And then we have the problem of those who say, well, look, the main verb is disciple. The direct object is the nations. So you disciple the nations how? The two participles tell you, by baptizing and teaching. Now, if you think that's a bizarre approach, just open up Lenski and read him on this passage. That's exactly the position Lenski takes. Grammatically, it's possible. But theologically and with the analogy of Scripture, it's nonsense. And even exegetically, it has a strand of nonsense because the pronoun them is a masculine. Ethne, nations, is a neuter. There should be agreement of gender with respect to nouns and their pronouns. But mathetes, the word for disciple, is a masculine. Therefore, Jesus assumes when he says, disciple the nations, baptizing them, that is, those who among the nations become disciples by means of the proclamation of this Trinitarian salvation brought to sinners by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptizing them into the name of this God who has come to them through the proclamation of the gospel, and they have rendered a saving response of repentance and faith, and having thus incorporated them formally and sacramentally into union with and submission to this triune God, now then give yourself to teaching them not minimal truth and then making them evangelists to go out and make more disciples. Again, this hyper-evangelistic mentality needs to come to this text. The great task, having made disciples, is then to baptize them and then to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And there you have the extensive and intensive instruction that is to be passed on to these disciples. Having voluntarily embraced the salvation and the government of this triune God, the assumption is such disciples stand ready to know the will of God and by His grace to do it. It doesn't say persuading them. Now that they've made a profession of faith, they ought to contemplate whether or not they should live a life of obedience. No, the assumption is if they've been made disciples, they stand ready to obey, anxious to obey. Heart of stone has been removed. They've been given a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit indwells them. God has written his law upon the heart. He's put his fear in their hearts so that they may not depart from him. And these true disciples, eager to know and do the will of God, he says, you teach them what that involves. So that's the essence of the heart of this passage and its teaching. Then we come thirdly to the great importance of this passage in the pastoral instruction of our people. First of all, as I've already alluded to this, its Christ-centered nature is absolutely vital as we face the task of evangelism with biblical realism concerning the native condition of those whom we are evangelizing. We believe what the Bible says. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They are spiritually blinded by the God of this world. They have a carnal disposition that is hostile to God. It is not subject to the law of God nor to the gospel of God. The human heart hates the gospel as much as it hates the law because it's a revelation of this triune God and they hate God. And we need to encourage them by saying again and again, my dear brothers and sisters, as you pray for those neighbors, you look for opportunities to speak to them, they seem to be more and more indifferent. Remember, you have a Savior who has all power in heaven and earth. And any given day, 
God can pierce the armor of their hearts and draw them to himself. And it will encourage your people instead of oppressing them with brow-beating, passionate, uh, almost cruel uh, attempts to drive them to the task of evangelism. Let them be drawn by that continual sight of an exalted Lord who has all the power in heaven and on earth. It's also vital to teach this text to your people. Frequently refer to it because of the comprehensive and balanced nature of this text. It just takes in the whole scope in a beautiful way. And in my preparation for these lectures, it's just raised me to a new level of appreciation for what God has deposited in these words. But then thirdly, its compelling nature is inescapable. If indeed the one who has all authority in heaven and upon earth has given an imperative, disciple the nations, if we claim to love him and loving him desire to obey him, the pressure of this task and privilege cannot be escaped. And every single conscience of every single well-instructed believer ought to feel the weight of this text upon his conscience. And here I quote those wonderful words of J.I. Packer in what is really now properly acknowledged to be a classic on evangelism, his lovely book, Evangelism in the Sovereignty of God, where Packer writes, the comprehensiveness of this promise shows us how wide is the application of the command to which it is appended. The phrase, even to the end of the world, makes it clear that the you to whom the promise was given was not solely and exclusively the eleven disciples. The promise extends to the whole Christian church throughout history, the entire community of which the eleven were, so to speak, founding members. It is therefore a promise for us, no less than for them, and a promise of great comfort as well. But if the promise extends to us, then the commission with which it is linked must extend to us also. The promise was given to encourage the eleven, lest they be overwhelmed at the size and difficulty of the task of world evangelism that Christ was laying upon them. It is our privilege to appropriate the promise. Then it is also our responsibility to accept the commission. The task laid upon the eleven is the church's constant task. And it is the church's task in general, if it is the church's task in general, then it is your task, my task in particular. If therefore we love God and are concerned to glorify Him, we must obey His command to evangelize. That's our text from the Gospels. Now let's turn to our text from the book of Acts, and you already know where we're going. I'm glad I'm not surprising you. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And let's note for just a moment, before we come particularly to verse 8, the setting of this task. According to these opening words of Luke 2, as some like to call the book of Acts, our Lord has died and risen from the dead. He has convinced his disciples of his real resurrection presence and has spent 40 days with them, instructing them concerning crucial issues relative to the kingdom of God. That takes in verses 1 to 3. The next great epical event in redemptive history is to be the coming of the Holy Spirit as the gift of the ascended Christ, verses 4 and 5, being assembled together with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, you have heard from me, for John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit 
not many days hence. Then we have their rather bizarre question, and that could lead us down rabbit trails in verse 6. And I pass over it, and our Lord gives his answer, which is, in my judgment, basically a deflection of the question, knowing they'll understand better when the Spirit comes as the Spirit of truth and illumination, the upper room discourse that has not yet happened. In spite of his 40 days post-resurrection instruction, things will come to their understanding that could not come until the Spirit was given. If we're going to be consistent in our handling of a passage like this and the promises of the upper room discourse. But, he says, verse 8, you shall receive power when or the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and you shall be my witnesses or witnesses of me, either one is a correct rendering, both not first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, as it's often read and expounded. You shall receive power, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. You shall be witnesses of me, or my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, what is the essence of the teaching of this text? First of all, our Lord emphasizes the fact that the coming of the Holy Spirit will have a direct bearing upon our being given power in conjunction with bearing witness to and of Christ. And this witness, according to the text, will be a simultaneous witness of Christ from the immediate geographical context in Jerusalem to the farthest reaches of the earth, and it will at one point all be simultaneous, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. So it's not Jerusalem, leave Jerusalem, go to Judea, then leave Judea, go to Samaria. No, the book of Acts records the church in Jerusalem was still functioning when the gospel penetrated the ends of the earth. And as most commentators are careful to point out, this verse becomes in a very real sense an outline for the structure of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Acts which in reality, according to verse 1, Luke regards the ongoing acts of the risen Christ. The former treatise I made, O Theophilus, concerning all things Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was received up. And so Luke envisions then, in the structuring of his book, he's going to give us an account of how this simultaneous witness to Christ came to birth as the gospel penetrates Jerusalem, spreads to Judea, then to Samaria, and then particularly from Acts 13 onward with the call of Paul uh, to missionary endeavor extends to the entire existing Roman Empire. That's the essence of the teaching of the text. The Spirit will come not to give people a coat of many colors, tingle up and down the spine, speak in tongues, dance in the aisle, be slain in the Spirit experience. That kind of nonsense needs to be repudiated in the clearest terms possible. The Holy Ghost does not come to make people bark like a dog or fall down flat when somebody who supposedly is filled with the Spirit touches their forehead. I hope when you see that stuff, everything in you prays prayers of imprecation upon these charlatans that fleece God's people and carry on that nonsense in the name of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And if anyone in that class of men hears this lecture in the name of the God of heaven, I call you to repentance before you stand before God. That wasn't in my notes, brethren, but I believe it needed to be said. All right, we've looked at the setting. We've looked at the essence of the teaching. Now, thirdly, the great importance of this text in pastoral instruction of our people 
in the area of evangelism. According to this text, the link between the sovereign authority of Christ and the abiding presence of Christ is the presence and power of the person of the Holy Spirit within the new covenant community. Now let me state that again. It's crucial. According to this text, the link between the Savior who has all authority in heaven and earth has gone back into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So the link between the sovereign authority of the ascended Christ and the abiding presence of Christ is the presence and power of the person of the Holy Spirit within the new covenant community. The promise, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, applied to that whole community, which at this time numbered approximately 120. But the dominant characteristic of the entire new covenant community as it grows even to the ends of the earth, that it is a pneumatic community. The Holy Spirit indwells every true member of that community. Peter makes that plain on the day of Pentecost because there's no indication that when the Spirit came and they began to speak in tongues and the dialects and languages they were speaking understood by people who gathered from the nations, it says they were speaking forth the mighty works of God. It doesn't say just the men. The women who were part of that 120 were testifying to the mighty works of God along with the men. Why? Because this was the validation of the prophecy of Joel. It shall come to pass afterward in those days. I will pour forth of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men will dream dreams. Your young men have visions. And God is validating that reality. This new covenant community is pneumatic. It's crucial in our doctrine of the church. There are not two circles of that community. Those who belong in an outer circle who do not yet have the Spirit. Those who are in the inner circle who have the Holy Spirit. No such bifurcation of the new covenant community begins to be recognized in the New Testament. Beginning here on the day of Pentecost, the entire community is pneumatic. They all receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it is vital that we remind our people again and again that the evangelistic mandate is not a mandate to engage in merely human activities, to be carried on under the impulse of carnal motivation, dependent for success upon human resources and cleverness. It is the real presence and operative power of the Holy Spirit that alone enables us to fulfill and find any success in our evangelistic endeavors. It is at this point that the words of our Lord Jesus need constantly to be kept before our people in conjunction with their evangelistic efforts. Without me, you can do nothing. But don't stop there. Go on to John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit. Without me you can do nothing. But with me and by my power you shall be fruit bearing disciples of the Lord Jesus. And so I say this text, Acts 1.8, is another crucial text that we ought carefully to expound lovingly, graciously, earnestly, passionately apply to the minds and hearts of our people. Now we come to our text from the epistle. And now you can't predict me quite as accurately. Where is he going to go? 1 Peter 3.15? Well, that's a possibility, but no, I'm not going there. 
I'm going to what, in my judgment, is the most helpful watershed text to believers concerning their evangelistic privileges, responsibilities, and opportunities. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. The apostle writes, Do all things without murmurings and questionings in order that, here's a purpose statement, in order that, I'm giving you this directive, in order that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding fast or holding forth the word of life that I may have whereof to glory in the day of Christ, that I did not run in vain, neither labor in vain. Now let's unpack the text for a few minutes. Once again, the context is significant. Paul is writing to a church that had become notorious for its fellowship with Paul in the furtherance of the gospel. He mentions it in his opening paragraph when he writes in verses 5 to 7, he's thankful for your fellowship in the furtherance of the gospel from the first day until now. There was something unique about this Philippian church that from the first day, and I think he's referring there, the first day when the gospel penetrated with power and some of these women were converted, there was a peculiar passion to see the gospel go forward. Verse 12 of the same chapter, he says, I would have you know, brethren, the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the progress of the gospel. He knows if I want to encourage those Philippians that I'm in prison, let me just tell them gospel concerns are going forward because of where I am. And he knew that would gladden their hearts. And then in verse 27 of the same chapter where he says, let me get the beginning of the verse, only let your manner of life be worthy of, of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your state, that you stand fast in one spirit, one soul, striving for the faith of the gospel. And then later on, he says, you're the only church that from the beginning of my new gospel endeavors and outreaches stood with me in the matter of giving and receiving. So, This was a peculiarly gospel-passionate church. And so this text has unusual significance in my judgment because of that. Now, the text itself is just preceded by what I regard to be the most helpful text in the whole Bible regarding how the Christian life is to be lived because it brings in short compass this beautiful biblical doctrine of limited synergism in the living of the Christian life. God's working and our working are concurrent realities. Verse 12, So then, my beloved, even as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For... It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's exhorting them to have renewed, serious, passionate commitment to work out the implications of their salvation. He encourages them that in so doing, they need never fear that their energetic outworking will outstrip God's internal working. No, for it is God who's working in you both to will and to work. When your will is inclined to obey him, God is inclined your will. When you follow that inclined will and you are given power to do what your will desires to do, God gave you the power. It's all of God, but it's all of you. You work it out with fear 
and with trembling in the confidence God's working it in you, then the first area of specific application he makes to this critical imperative is do everything you do without murmurings and questionings. The murmurings in the Septuagint is the same word describing those ten incidents in the wilderness generation. They murmured, they murmured. That's discontent with God, discontent with his providence, discontent with the leaders he puts over you. He says, do everything you do minus murmurings. And it's difficult to know what he meant by questionings. It could be questionings of God's dealings. It could be a kind of a cynical uh, attitude, whatever it is. It was something inconsistent with what the gospel produces in men. So he says, do everything without murmurings and questionings. To what end? That you may become blameless and harmless, not sinless, but no just cause to blame you for hypocrisy, saying one thing, doing another, harmless, Your lives are full of grace and graciousness. Children of God without blemish. Children of God who have no marked blemish upon your character. If I take a white sheet of paper and I put a little black dot and I hold it up and I say, what do you see? You'll all say, I see a black dot. He's saying, don't be black dot Christians. That when people see you, That area of unmortified sin, that uncultivated grace, is what stands out. He said, no, I want you to aim at becoming blameless and harmless children of God without blemish. Now where? Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation indicating that he's very conscious they are living out their lives in a hostile environment, in a pervasively wicked environment, reflecting all the standards of Rome that were present in Roman colonies, which Philippian was in the providence of God. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And he says, if this is so, two things will be true. Among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. And he says, only when this is true, can I have a sense that I have not labored in vain, that I may have whereof to glory in the day of Christ, that I did not run in vain, neither labor in vain. If you are to fulfill the goals of my apostolic ministry, you will be a community of people passionate about pervasive, consistent holiness of life to the end that your lifestyle individually and corporately will be a constant luminary in the midst of the darkness of this world and you will hold fast to, as that which produces such a life, Or the use of the verb can mean the epecho, holding forth the word of life. So he's giving them this call to blameless holiness that validates what the gospel does and to hold forth the gospel that explains why and how they live the way they live. He says life and lip must be joined. Your life must validate what the gospel does. Your lips must explain what the gospel is. And Paul is passionate in his appeal to the Philippians that they join him in this desire to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling specifically in this way to the end that they may shine brightly and may hold forth the word of life Boldly, I've given you a very extensive uh, reproduction of the comments of John Stone in his marvelous commentary on Philippians. If you preach through Philippians, get a copy of this. Uh, Clock and Clock did a reprint of it. I'm sure it's readily available through the used book uh, 
uh, outfits that you can access on the internet. But I want to read a good bit, not entirely, but you read the entire quote at your leisure. But he captures this twin emphasis of the Apostle Paul. The thought of responsibility for the power of example, as we have seen, is suggested by the words, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, is explicitly brought out by the Apostle in his next clause, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. These words may be taken as an injunction, among whom shine ye, The view of the meaning given by our translators, however, is at least as natural. Paul appears to be, with a little variation, repeating perhaps consciously the statement of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells his hearers what is their calling as his disciples. He doesn't say, you ought to be. You live out a life that is characterized by the Beatitudes and you are the light of the world. The world does not produce people with poverty of spirit. It doesn't produce people who mourn over sin. It doesn't produce people who are meek and gracious, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers. The world doesn't produce that. Jesus said, my grace produces it when I bring people into my kingdom and I constitute my new covenant community, lights in the world. The assumption being they don't huddle together and go off in a corner in some kind of a Christian ghetto. They are living in the midst of a world of darkness and they shine as lights. And John Stone rightly draws that connection. But then he goes on to say, In his statement of the way in which Christians shine, he says, by holding forth the word of life, the apostle passes from the image of a luminary and adopts one somewhat of this kind, a herald of the king of kings, holding out to public view a scroll on which is inscribed in great letters a proclamation of mercy a promise of everlasting life to all that believe in Jesus. The primary reference here is evidently from the tenor of the whole passage to that proclamation of the truth and power of the gospel, which to all who are willing in any degree to attend is made by completeness of Christian character, by the exhibition of spiritual energy and sweetness and patience. Nothing holds forth the word of life more impressively than a life manifestly governed by that word. A Christian of this type is himself a gospel, an epistle of Christ, written in letters so large and fair that even those who run can scarce but read. Such a distinct Christian life a life explicit and convincing to all observers as a confession of Christ is the legitimate fruitage from the seed of truth received by the soul. Scripture knows nothing of invisible religion. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it gives light to all that are in the house. But having underscored that our life is the validation of the gospel, John Stone goes on to say, but to hold forth the word of life implies not merely quiet, consistent beauty of character, but definite action for the extension of the kingdom of Christ. Every believer has heard the Father say, Son, go work in my vineyard and in some way is busy among the vines. His faith has given him oneness of purpose with Christ, who died, who rose, who reigns to overthrow sin. By lip, then, as well as by the eloquence of holy living, the saint endeavors to speak for Christ as God gives him ability and opportunity. 
be it to his little children by his own fireside or to assembled thousands, he cannot but speak the things which grace has taught him and given him to experience. I say I know of no text that brings together in such close conjunction these vital principles with respect to the task of evangelism. Since we and our people are often victims of extremes, of reaction and overreaction, this text is a wonderfully balanced word that keeps these two things together which must never be put asunder. Our individual and corporate godliness of walk and our aggressive holding forth of the word of life. Like few other texts, This one underscores the fact that individual and corporate holiness of life before a crooked and perverse generation alone establishes the credibility of our verbal witness. Now that's exactly what Peter underscores in the text some of you may have thought I was going to use. 1 Peter 3.15 Sanctify Christ as Lord ready always to give answer to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Peter's assumption is that the lifestyle of believers sooner or later are going to provoke questions from unbelievers. What in the world makes you the different man that you are? You don't laugh at the dirty jokes told in the office. You're not ogling at the backside of the secretaries when they walk away from the water fountain like all the other guys are. You seem to really love your wife and speak honorably of your wife. You seem to delight in the burdens and the privileges of fatherhood. What in God's name makes you tick, man? The life is the arrowhead that penetrates the human consciousness for the shaft of the verbal proclamation of the gospel. And these things must not be separated, brethren. The Apostle Paul in this text brings the two together and he says, it's only when those two things are operative in those to whom I ministered that my ministry has accomplished its goal and I can stand before my Lord unashamed that I was not a failure. So I leave those three major texts with you and then bringing this lecture close to a close, let me give you several other miscellaneous texts that you may want to use with your people. Having given those three texts, then number four, the example of our Lord in his compassion for sinners. First John 2, 6, he that says he abides in him ought to walk even as he walked. How did he walk? Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He had the reputation, according to Luke 15, 1 and 2, not just being a preacher to sinners. What galled them was not that Jesus stood up in Matthew's house on a table and preached hellfare and damnation to publicans and sinners, but he was eating with them. He was showing a willingness to be identified with men as fallen image bearers of God and relate to them and establish relationships that earn the right to speak pointedly to them concerning their souls. We can set before our Lord as motivation and direction in the evangelistic endeavor the example of our Lord. Then, Fifthly, the example of the Apostle Paul in his sense of indebtedness to all men. And I've listed the text. I'm a debtor both to the Jew, to the Greek, to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And then the necessity that men hear the gospel if they are to be saved. Romans 10, 9 and following. This can be brought to bear upon the consciences of our people and desperately needs to be in this day when the lines concerning historic orthodoxy and heterodoxy are blurred. 
we must again teach that if men are not united to Christ through a believing embrace of the gospel, they are lost and they are on their way to hell. We must say it tenderly, lovingly, passionately, but it's true. And then the final text, the necessity of public confession of Christ as a badge of our discipleship. Matthew 10, 32, he that confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. He that denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father. So I lay before you these three major texts and these four other subsidiary texts. And then in bringing the lecture to a close, let me make these couple of applications and observations. From these texts, it should be clear that it is God's purpose that the church should be a community whose life can only be exegeted by its message. You get that? It's God's purpose that the church should be a community whose life can only be exegeted by its message. It is possible to live blameless, gospel-transformed lives before men, but unless those who see such lives hear the message that has produced such lives, they will never be saved. And that should be evident from all of these texts. On the other hand, it's God's purpose that the church should be a community whose verbal witness is validated by its life a lifestyle that enforces the truth that in its message alone is their life and salvation. In other words, when we start opening our mouths to talk about salvation, they have every right to ask, salvation from what to what? And we should be able to say, from the things that once bound and changed me to what has made me a free man cleaned up my mind, cleaned up my mouth, put my marriage back together, gives me love for people that love my God. Every Christian ought to be able to say that so that when we explain the gospel, they have some idea what the gospel saves from and what it saves to. In short, it is only when the church is comprised of lights that shine brightly and mouths that speak boldly and clearly that the church is fulfilling its God-ordained mission of evangelism. And since the church is comprised of individuals, the consciences of the individual members must be made to feel the pressure of the clear teaching of Scripture concerning the task of evangelism. This does not mean that we believe and teach that each and every member of the church should be an aggressive, well-equipped, confrontational evangelist. Having addressed the mandate for the task of evangelism, we'll take a break at this point and then in the next hour begin by addressing the biblical motives which ought to impel us towards and accompany us in the fulfillment of this task of evangelism. When I said that we must not rub our people's conscience raw, that each should be a confrontational evangelist, I mean get everyone to memorize uh, the four laws or Ray Comfort's questions or the Roman road and then every opportunity you have to buttonhole people and confront them. There's not a verse in the Bible to justify that goal. And yet, in my days of itinerant ministry, when I preached in evangelical churches all around the country, I saw this again and again and again. And I even had the nerve on more than one occasion in groups of ministers say, Brethren, will you produce for me one clear text from the New Testament epistles that gives an imperative from an apostle or an apostolically recognized letter that every Christian is to be a confrontational cold turkey evangelist. They looked at me like I was a heretic. I'm still waiting for the text. There are a few texts that come close to it. 
by inference, the First Peter 3 text, the Philippians 2 text. But among all the imperatives that touch individual life, work life, family life, relationship to the world, relationship to the government. Think of the scope of the things the apostles addressed in the letters. Surely, if every believer who's healthy spiritually should be a cold turkey confrontational evangelist, there should be some indication that this loomed high in the thinking of the apostles as they formed the churches. But you'll look in vain for it. It isn't there, brethren. It's not there. And God help us if we put it there by forced exegesis or for any other reason. Well, we need to break now. Let's pray and thank God for his help in this first hour this morning. Our Father, we're so grateful that you've given us a changeless, infallible rule of faith and of practice. We thank you for the portions of your word we've been privileged to examine this morning and we pray that you would help us to embrace them as we become persuaded of their truth. We ask Lord if anything I have stated has had the chaff of mere human wisdom blow upon it, bring it to nothing. But may your living and abiding word take up residence in all of our hearts. Thank you for your presence with us. Continue with us through the morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.